Studies show that the average millennial thinks about the Harry Potter film franchise at least six times every hour. I say those are rookie numbers, because what else would you even think about? It's been almost 20 years since the first film premiered, and fans still can't get enough. But did you know that many of the characters and creatures almost looked completely different? Some of them are described differently in the books, but others were designed in ways that totally conflict with what we saw on screen. So let's dive in and look at all the designs we almost got for our favorite Harry Potter characters. All be fascinated to hear what you have to say. One of the characters that hardcore Potterheads complain about the most is the look of he who must not be named. His name is Voldemort. Phileas, you might as well use it. Pretty sure that if we actually say his name, we get demonetized. Wizarding YouTube don't play. In the movie, he looks pretty cool. He's creepy, pale white, and has those weird nose slits. Fans of the movies were a bit weirded out by his look at first. Needless to say, everyone got used to it over time. Now he's one of the most iconic movie villains ever. If we had to rank him, he's probably sandwiched somewhere between Darth Vader and Sauron. His creepy, pale, snake man style probably has a lot to do with that. That being said, book fans are still not quite over it. In the books, he's described as even more snake-like in appearance. More importantly, the character is supposed to have crazy red eyes. Maybe the movie people were just afraid he'd look too much like Christopher Lloyd from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I mean, can you blame him? After tonight, no one will ever again question my power. Now this is probably the biggest complaint book fans have about the entire movie series. In the books, Harry's eyes are probably described almost as much as his scar is. He's supposed to have the sloppy dark hair of his father and the emerald green eyes of his mother. It's almost a running joke throughout the series. You look very like your father. Except for the eyes, of course. You have your... My mother's eyes, yeah. Every single character who knew Lily Potter seems obsessed with telling him he has his mother's eyes. What's the problem? Well, Daniel Radcliffe has blue eyes. They tried to give him green ones, but he didn't like the contacts. It's also weird that they couldn't have just fixed that with CGI. You're telling me that they could make a CGI troll, green gots, and a living chess set, but blue eyes to green was a little too much? You could do that in Microsoft Paint. Luckily, the actress who plays adult Lily has blue eyes, so no problem, right? Wrong. When Snape gave Harry his memories, we're introduced to the young Lily Potter. This actress has dark eyes. Snape's literal last words that he gave only a few minutes earlier were that Harry had his mom's eyes. You have your mother's eyes. What's worse is that she's introduced with a hard close-up on her face. So if there was any doubt about whether or not she had blue eyes, it was cleared up really quickly. After having to deal with detailed crazy Potterheads for years, you'd think they would have known better. You couldn't have cast a blue-eyed actress. The budget for these movies were only about six trillion apiece. Mad-Eye has one of the weirder looks in the Harry Potter films. He looks like a pirate who's trying too hard to pull off his glass eye. The look grows on you, but fans weren't super fond of it at first. He was supposed to be a lot more scarred up, and his fake eye was supposed to be more natural. Also, some concept art showed him missing a big chunk of his nose. Not everybody can pull off that red skull noseless look, so that was probably a good choice. It's a good thing that Brendan Gleeson was pretty perfect as the world's grumpiest horror. End of story. Goodbye. The end. If only we could get a spin-off movie about him taking on evil wizards like the grizzled magic cop he is. Tonks is one of the most beloved minor characters in the series. She's got a lot more style and attitude than most of the other B players do. You might not know that if you watch the movies because she's got about two minutes of screen time. She also is lacking a lot of her style from the books. Ideally, she should look like she just stepped out of whatever the Diagon Alley equivalent of Hot Topic is every day. Her hair is supposed to be a lot more vibrant and interesting as well. Her love story with Lupin, her child, and everything else about her character was toned down as well. Honestly, it's almost surprising that they didn't cut her out entirely. It's kind of sad that what could have been one of the most vibrant big screen characters ended up being one of the most forgettable. Seriously, the actress had a better time in one episode of The Mandalorian than she did in the entire movie franchise. Even her forgettable part in Game of Thrones looked impressive compared to the sparse few seconds she was in the franchise. What's weird is that she's still remembered primarily as Tonks, no matter what else she does. Well, it looks like Tonks is so cool that even a few scenes is enough to make her memorable. The Death Eaters went through a lot of changes over the years. Their first appearance in the film series was not subtle. They had pointed hoods and skull masks. The look was a half step away from looking like it belonged in Django Unchained. The look in the subsequent movies was a big improvement. They wore these cool, personalized bad guy masks. 
Well, unless they were one of the main baddies. Lucius wasn't big on hiding those golden locks of his. Though I have to wonder who made all of these weird masks. Is there some sort of multiversal bad guy mask designer that makes them for everybody? Does he have pictures of Darth Vader, Bane, and Michael Myers on his wall? The concept art designs actually looked much cooler than both. They looked sort of like if the Eyes Wide Shut masquerade people were having a gothic Alice in Wonderland party. Actually, there's no way that Lucius Malfoy wasn't throwing those parties every single weekend, now that I think about it. There are a lot of cool CGI creatures in Harry Potter. Then there are some creatures that don't look that great. The giants are unfortunately some of the most disappointing creatures, especially the scenes with Grop. Something about the animations just never looked real. Some of the concept art looked much more interesting. The look was something like a caveman Geralt of Rivia. Neither worked quite as well as the giants from Game of Thrones did, but at least Harry Potter managed to stick the ending. It's kind of surprising that the designers didn't make it work for the giants. They created some of the most iconic creatures in movie monster history. Tell me you aren't still terrified that Basilisk is real. So it seems strange that one of the creatures that tripped them up was just a giant version of a person. Could they not have just called the rock? Looking back on it, could any other actress have ever played Bellatrix Lestrange? How do I look? Helena Bonham Carter is perfect as Voldemort's psycho second-in-command. And maybe girlfriend. She's basically the Harley Quinn to his Joker. She definitely needs a Birds of Prey-style solo movie, too. If you think that Voldemort and Bellatrix are just creepy friends, I have some bad news for you. You see, there was this little play called Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. In it, we find out about this chick named Delphine, who's actually Voldemort and Bellatrix's daughter. So, yeah, just take a second to absorb all of the horrifying implications there. That pitch you feel in your stomach right now? That never goes away. But back to Bellatrix. A lot of the movie character's style and personality comes from Carter's charismatically crazy performance. The book Bellatrix was plenty mad, but didn't have quite as much style. She was your standard, dark-haired femme fatale who was a lot more concerned with her superior blood status. Some of the concept art even has her looking a lot more like Narcissa Malfoy. This is pretty hard to even imagine. It's kind of like how the original plan for Captain Jack Sparrow was for him to be a pretty normal pirate. Like, who would these characters even be without their quirky craziness? I'm not really sure who made the decision that Lestrange's hair should look like a dirty bird's nest. That detail definitely was not in the books. Like, if a crow randomly flew out of her hair, it wouldn't be surprising at all. Okay, before we even start, let's just clear something up. Emma Watson is amazing. She's a great actress, a great activist, and seems like a pretty great person all around. You're amazing, you are. She was awesome as Hermione, but her look never quite matched the one from the books. The Hermione from the books is described as frizzy-haired and having big front teeth. They started the movie version with crazy hair, but backed off on that in the third movie. She never had big teeth, which is a real shame. The scene where Hermione changes her own teeth because she was getting bullied would have been great on the big screen. To be completely honest, the frizzy hair in the books doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Magic can fix everything from cracked glasses to regrowing bones. You'd think it could do the work of a hair straightener. Even if it couldn't, Hermione comes from the muggle world. She would have potentially had a hair straightener. The movies made the right call. Also, the book Hermione wasn't likely as stunning as Emma Watson. Who is, though? Rupert Grint is the perfect Ron Weasley. In fact, all of the Weasleys are considered pitch-perfect casting choices. They all have that iconic red hair and those over-the-top attitudes. That being said, there is one thing that the Weasleys are severely lacking. Where are the freckles? If there are two things that everyone knows about the Weasleys is that they have red hair and are eaten up with freckles. The movie versions of the characters are, strangely, freckle-free. Perhaps the CGI technology to freckleify faces just wasn't up to par while they were making the Harry Potter movies. Those are thousands of freckles you have to keep up through every single frame of film. This is actually a much wider spread problem than just Harry Potter. Across all film mediums, our film characters are severely lacking in beautifully freckled faces. Free the freckles, Hollywood! Free the freckles! Now, if you only watched the movies, you're probably thinking, who's Fenrir Greyback? Well, he's that creepy-looking guy who burned down the Weasley's house. You might not have realized this, but that dude's a werewolf. It's understandable if you didn't pick that up, because the movies didn't really bother with it. One of the easiest ways to fix that would have been to actually make him turn into a wolf. 
There's a scene where he's attacking the Weasley home in the middle of the night. That would have been an easy way to let those non-book readers know what was up. They wrote the scene for the film anyway, so why not? His human look in the movies is… Uh, okay. He doesn't really look like a monster so much as he does a really, really creepy dude. What happened to you, ugly? <laughs> no, not you. A creepy dude who goes to the same cheap tailor as the original Sabretooth. The same dentist, too, now that I think about it. Greyback was originally going to look much scarier looking. He was going to have sunken in yellow eyes, a long mane of hair, and a lot of scars. So, you know, like a werewolf. They decided to go in a slightly subtler way with the character. It's hard to believe that the same designers worked on Greyback and Bellatrix. They went in two completely different directions there. They decided to go iconic with one and make the other look like a reject from the Underworld franchise. That's not fair. At least in that franchise, they actually got to be werewolves. If you saw The Little Mermaid, you were probably a bit disappointed in how the merpeople looked in Harry Potter. It was a bit less a whole new world and a bit more terrifying. As freaky looking as the underwater creatures were, they were actually walked back a little from the original look. The concept art shows creatures so inhuman that they would make the dude from the shape of water seem like a Hemsworth brother. Still, would it have been so hard to have friendly looking merpeople? They didn't even sing one song. We know they have good singing voices too because they recorded an album in a dragon egg. We're dropping a challenge right now. Come up with the perfect album name for the Harry Potter merpeople in the comment section. I'll start with uh, Black Lake Blues. Two on the nose? One of the most shocking things to happen in both the movies and the books is the scene where Nagini explodes out of that lady. Needless to say, that's a pretty surprising development. Most people don't expect to see snakes randomly jettisoning out of old lady faces. If you do, there's probably a hotline or something that you should call. What's crazy is that the original version of the scene was supposed to be even crazier. She was going to slowly pull herself out of the old lady's mouth. At some point along the way, they clearly remembered that kids watch these movies. Though that film did start with Nagini literally eating a lady, so maybe they didn't care about it so much. It's kind of strange that it's almost never mentioned that she used to be a human circus performer in France. Nor was it mentioned that she was also allied with the other evil wizard Grindelwald. You'd think that would have come up at some point. You could almost think that J.K. Rowling made some of these details up as she went. <laughs> nah, that couldn't possibly be true. Okay, so there's nothing in this world more terrifying than Dementors. They're floating monsters that literally feed on your happiness and suck your soul right out of your face. It really doesn't get much more terrifying than that. Turns out, it actually does. The movie Dementors basically looked like floating CGI ring wraiths. The original concept art showed them looking a lot more skeletal. We would have actually seen more of what they looked like underneath those CGI robes. You don't get to see much, just a little glimpses of their white corpse-like skin. Not to mention their sunken black eyes and their freakishly long fingers. Uh, nope, nope, nope. Uh, I don't need that in my life. I'm happy with fake looking Dementors, thank you very much. And just to wipe that from our minds, let's take a few seconds to look at the Niffler from Fantastic Beasts. Ah, look at how cute he looks. All he wants is as many coins as he can carry. Excuse all thief in the whole world. Ah, okay, that's better. Moving on. Bill Weasley is kind of a contradictory character. In many ways, he's the best Weasley. He's the one that's supposed to be the most charismatic and heroic of the bunch. Somehow, though, he's the most forgettable Weasley of them all. Though you do have to admit that he rocks that hair. Seriously, if there's such a thing as wizard shampoo commercials, you know he's in them swishing that back and forth. Not everybody can pull off long hair ginger, but Bill Weasley definitely can. The one thing everyone remembers about him is that he was horribly disfigured by Fenrir Greyback. Well, unless you've watched the movies. In that, he's just kind of scarred up a little bit. Apparently, the scarring in the books was just a little bit much for the big screen. Of course, this was the movie where Dobby gets a knife in the chest, so who knows? It's kind of like how Kylo Ren was hideously disfigured in The Force Awakens, but had teeny tiny little scratches in The Last Jedi. Speaking of Star Wars, both the movies and the books leave out the part where Bill joins an evil space empire. That seems like an oversight. Honestly, it seems more like something Percy would do. Well, Neville, I'm sure we can find a place for you in our rank. Neville Longbottom is one of the most surprising characters in the franchise. He spends most of the series as a lovable, clumsy doofus. He's basically the Jerry from Parks and Recreation of the Wizarding World. Then he surprises everybody by acting as a big hero in the very last book. The dude uses the Sword of Gryffindor to destroy Nagini like the Braveheart-style hero he always was. 
There's a big difference between Book Neville and Movie Neville. That is, that Book Neville never becomes the hottest dude in Hogwarts. Seriously. The movie Neville got so attractive in the last movie that the term Neville Longbottomed was invented. That's when you go from normal looking to freakishly attractive for those that don't use Tumblr. The guy went from being Harry's weird friend to a young Clive Owen. You know what? That prophecy was onto something. Neville Longbottom might actually be the real hero of this story. It's been a long time since we've said goodbye to the Harry Potter movie franchise, but its legacy lives on. Emma Watson, Daniel Radcliffe, and Rupert Grind grew up with their characters, but the cast wasn't allowed to let loose. Stop, stop, stop. They had to follow certain rules in order to not be expelliarmus right out of there. Let's take a look. You may think that as fans of the books would have already known what was going to happen, there wasn't really a risk of spoilers. However, the Harry Potter movies reached an entirely new audience, often inspiring viewers to pick up the books. Once the movies proved popular, it was down to the cast and crew to keep their mouths shut about upcoming plots. Everything from shooting locations to twists and turns had to be kept completely under wraps. That can be difficult when reporters try and grill you about the storylines and press interviews, but that's show business. Pretty much every movie that's ever been or will be requires a little bit of teasing. After all, if we knew the entire plot, we'd never go and see it in theaters, now would we? The magical world of Harry Potter is no different. As time moved on, J.K. Rowling was still writing the book series, so would often confide in cast members about what was going to happen next. There must have been an overwhelming amount of trust between all parties involved. That's a huge risk to take with a multi-million dollar baby. When the movies first started filming, the main cast members were young and innocent. Daniel Radcliffe was plucked from obscurity at the tender age of 11 to don Harry's famous glasses. Rupert Grint and Emma Watson were also in grade school. At that point in their lives, all they had to worry about was whether they had enough pocket money. However, as the film series moved on, the cast grew up. Kids have a nasty habit of doing that. For the last few years of shooting, the main three characters were of legal drinking age and enjoyed the odd night out. There was a strict call for professionalism, but unfortunately, it didn't always go to plan. Like any typical young man, Radcliffe sometimes turned up for work looking worse for wear. Imagine doing those action scenes when you're sporting one heck of a hangover. No thanks. It's not unusual for actors to get panned for turning up pie-eyed, but you can't exactly uncast Harry Potter after a decade now, can ya? Luckily for Daniel, he would have had to have done something akin to Voldemort's level of evil to get his butt kicked off the set. You just can't have Harry Potter without Harry Potter. When the movies first started out, no one knew who Daniel Radcliffe, Rupert Grint, or Emma Watson were. They were just some kids that nobody gave a monkey's behind about. Fast forward to now and their household names. Okay, Emma Watson is arguably the most successful out of the three, but they all made an impression on audiences the world over. There's no denying that. However, the franchise did pack some serious star power too. Michael Gambon, Maggie Smith, Ray Fine, Emma Thompson, Gary Oldman, and Alan Rickman all had important parts to play. Not only are they physically older than the main three, but they've got impressive resumes. It goes without saying that there would have been a pecking order on set. The older cast helped the younger ones immensely, but asked for respect in return. You don't just rock up to a set and diss Alan Rickman for goodness sake. You say, yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir. The franchise wouldn't have lasted as long as it did without the relationship between the older and younger cast. It was part of the well-oiled machine that made serious bank for the studio. There's a lot that goes into being a child actor. It's not all sunshine roses and fat checks. It's hard work, no social life, and long hours. Ryan Reynolds famously said that he doesn't understand why people want their kids to be actors. Instead, they could just skip the middlemen and check them straight into rehab. Thankfully, our favorite trio seems to have stayed on the straight and narrow, but it wasn't easy. As a rule, the kids had to study and keep on top of their homework when they were shooting. Otherwise, they may have found themselves out on the cold cobbles of Diagon Alley jobless. Tutors were often on set, so when the youngsters had a break between filming, they were studying. That's an awful lot of work for kids to take on, but that's the way the cookie crumbles, right? Emma Watson went on to get a degree from Brown University in English Literature, but it took her longer than most. Instead of four years, it took Watson five. Why? Her acting schedule was so demanding that she had to take two full semesters off. At least she could use her already sizable fortune to pay the fees and isn't up to her eyeballs in debt like the rest of us. Ah, relationships in Hollywood. Aren't they wonderful? There's nothing quite like seeing two co-stars hooking up in real life. 
Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt did it and made a good go of it until it spectacularly crumbled. There weren't any strict rules about dating on the HP set, but it was discouraged. You can't exactly blame the director for wanting to avoid any teen drama while trying to make a masterpiece. There were a lot of rumors that Emma Watson hooked up with Daniel or Rupert, but it wasn't meant to be. Radcliffe called the idea incestuous. After filming ended, Bonnie Wright, aka Ginny Weasley, dated Jamie Campbell Bauer, who played young Grindelwald. The pair ended up separating, but it was nice while it lasted. For the most part, relationships between cast members were successfully avoided. Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart could have taken a leaf out of their book, now couldn't they? It would have saved a whole lot of pain for Twilight fans who had to watch that whole thing play out in the public eye. Considering how young the cast of Harry Potter was, they pretty much grew up like siblings, which vetoed any romantic feelings right off the bat. It's only natural that the cast and crew would have wanted to take a memento or two after filming ended. You don't work on a project for a decade and walk away empty-handed. However, there were strict rules concerning this. What's the harm in taking a robe or a wand, you ask? Well, these are part of Warner Bros. history, but they would also fetch a pretty penny if sold. It's not uncommon for crew members to squirrel something away only to pop it up on eBay later. If discovered, it can greatly damage your reputation in the business and even lead to lawsuits. It's best just to keep your hands where everyone can see them to avoid any future trouble. Of course, there are the odd exceptions to the rule. Most of the cast has something to remember their time by, but it was all done by the book and okayed by the big bosses. Apparently, the set was not dismantled by the cast and crew either, but by another company. This was probably to avoid anything going missing. No one was getting out of there with a free mandrake root. These movies weren't Quentin Tarantino works. There was no promiscuity, no close-to-the-knuckle jokes. It was simply good, clean, wizarding fun. That being said, it was important for the cast to uphold that and not be caught out doing anything they shouldn't. The series was mainly directed at younger audiences, so any whiff of a scandal could have seriously hurt the brand. Grint, Watson, and Radcliffe were all expected to be on their best behavior. Considering young actors can often go off the rails, we're looking at you, Lindsay Lohan, they did an impeccable job. There were no public scandals, no solicitous pictures, everything went as smoothly as Hedwig gliding on the wind. May she rest in peace. As for the older members of the cast, well, they were all pretty respectable anyway. No one too risque was hired, as it simply wouldn't have worked. Audiences sometimes find it hard to separate the actor from the character. The actors were under instructions to be role models and upstanding citizens. Just like with any job, the longer you've been around, the more people you know. Emma Thompson and Helena Bonham Carter have been in the acting business for decades. It's only natural that their paths have crossed before, but to say there was bad blood would have been an understatement. In the early 90s, Thompson was married to actor and director Sir Kenneth Branagh. They were the British it couple of their time, starring in several movies together and basically ruling the red carpet. That all changed when old Kenny Boy met Helena on the set of 1994's Frankenstein and embarked on an affair. Thompson and Brannock divorced a year later, so it's not hard to see why things were a little strained. Producers were rightly concerned that it may be a little awkward on set between the two actresses. However, both insisted that peace had been made years ago. Professionalism is of the utmost importance on movie sets. No one wants to be worrying about who isn't talking to who when you've got Voldemort to worry about. Hermione Granger's hair is an epic battle in itself. Just like the no drinking rule, it was imperative for all cast members to be sober in every sense of the word. Drugs are a huge no-no, especially when you're young and in Hollywood. Vincent Crabb actor Jamie Waylett was let go after he was arrested for growing substances. Instead, he was replaced by another character from the books, Blaze Zabini. If you want to keep working in the industry, especially when you're still new, don't get mixed up in that sort of thing. It's just not worth it, kids. Waylett faced further legal troubles after being given the boot. In 2011, he was charged with theft after stealing from a supermarket during the London riots. Slytherin by name, Slytherin by nature. It just goes to show why these things are vetoed. One thing leads to another, and it's a slippery old slope. Luckily, the rest of the cast followed orders and didn't get mixed up in that sort of thing. Or at the very least, they didn't get caught doing it. This is more of an anecdote than a steadfast rule, but it's too good not to mention. While filming The Goblet of Fire, Rupert Grint and Matthew Lewis, aka Neville Longbottom, were in Alan Rickman's car. The two were presumably having lunch when they managed to spill a milkshake all over the interior. 
Rickman was not happy about it, so when he got a brand new BMW, he banned Grant and Lewis from going anywhere near the vehicle. That's totally understandable, given the circumstances. Respecting other people's property is the key to good working relationships. Given how expensive cars can be, nobody wants someone spilling stuff all over it. We can almost smell it through the screen. Hopefully, Grant and Lewis paid for it to be valeted at least. There wasn't a written ban or anything, but this incident probably taught everyone a solid lesson. Don't horse around when holding milkshakes in an acting icon's car. The response will be frostier than Uncle Vernon. Harry Potter may have finished years ago, but the movie franchise lives on in our hearts and minds. And on our screens in the Fantastic Beasts saga, of course, Hogwarts didn't just make wizards out of their students, but stars out of their actors. Some of the cast were already at the top of their game, while others, like our main three, were unknowns. So, how did the movies help boost their careers? Who's earning the most now? Join us as we count down the highest earning actors ever to graduate from Dumbledore's school. Ray Fiennes is one of Hollywood's finest actors, although he isn't one that you see on screen as much as others. He starred in some incredible movies, from Schindler's List to In Bruges. Of course, he was also Harry Potter's nemesis, he who shall not be named, but he who kind of always is anyway, Voldemort. He can't have the franchise without its main antagonist, which might explain his $30 million net worth. For the most part, Fiennes isn't in that many scenes. It's just that his role is so crucial to the overall story that it literally couldn't be done without him. Plus, that makeup had to take an incredibly long time to do, so he had to be compensated for that. It's not unusual for some actors to turn down roles that mean they would need to spend hours in the prep chair, so let's give credit where it's due. When we think of our high school bullies, we have to be thankful they didn't have any magical prowess beyond the flushing of a toilet. Draco Malfoy was the worst of the worst, but really you can't blame him. He was born into a corrupted, evil family, so is it any wonder that he was a complete terror? Tom Felton has accrued a fortune of $35 million, which is a worthy sum, especially considering he's still pretty young. We were lucky to get around delivering papers for a few bucks a week, and there Felton was raking in the dough. His character was rich. Tom Felton himself is rich. Maybe that's where we're going wrong? If we start dressing as millionaires, will our bank balances mystically grow overnight? Tom has had some noteworthy roles since Harry Potter ended, including on CW's The Flash. He's still very much active in the Hollywood world, although these days he leaves his broomstick at the door. You can't blame him. They're so difficult to park these days and janitors keep mistaking them for theirs. What's a guy to do? He's Commissioner Gordon, Dracula, and Sirius Black. Gary Oldman is the creme de la creme of acting talent from the United Kingdom. He's had so many roles that it's difficult to count, so when he signed on to Harry Potter, it was a win for everyone involved. He came at a price, though. Oldman is supposedly worth $50 million, and presumably, he has a big fat smile on his face. He's an Oscar-winning sensation, but Potter fans know him simply as Harry's godfather and protector. The actor did an impeccable job of bringing the character to life, so much so that it's likely no one else would have ever been able to do serious justice. Although, we know Heath Ledger once asked him why he was so serious on the set of The Dark Knight. <laughs> Sorry, just couldn't resist throwing that joke in. And I'm sure we won't be the last. 50 million might sound like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, what his career has gained him is a drop in the ocean compared to his younger contemporaries. Emma Thompson and Gary Oldman have crossed paths many times over the years, cutting their teeth in the industry in the same era. That could explain why both of these veteran actors have similar fortunes. Thompson took on the part of kooky, wide-eyed Professor Trelawney. In many cases, she offered light relief in movies that got increasingly serious as they progressed. Aside from her dodgy predictions, one of Trelawney's most recognizable aspects is her aesthetic. Her unkempt hair, love of headscarves, and cats all make her a truly lovable character. Lest we forget when she was sacked by the Ministry of Magic when they started interfering in Hogwarts. She was devastated, leading most of us to sob along with her. Thompson earned every single dime of her astronomical paycheck. Bravo, Emma.
Bravo. Bonus fact, Emma was once married to Kenneth Branagh, who left her for Helena Bonham Carter after they shot Frankenstein. Awkward! Thankfully, the three actors seem to have moved on from their 90s exploits and buried the hatchet with one another and not in one another. Now we're getting down to the thick of it with our first member of the terrific trio. Rupert Grintz became a firm fan favorite with his depiction of lovable Ron Weasley. He played the part to a T, bringing Ron's humorous, often self-deprecating wits to life. Unlike his co-stars Emma Watson and Daniel Radcliffe, Grintz has largely stayed out of the limelight. Most of his wealth came from the franchise, with acting jobs since being few and far between. It's important to note that it's not like he's trying and failing to get parts, he's just happy being financially secure. That doesn't mean he hasn't dipped in and out of the industry to top up his $50 million fortune, though. In 2017, he starred in and executively produced the TV series Snatch, based on the movie of the same name. Grinch seems to prefer the small screen over the big ones these days, with TV shows often turning into hits bigger than blockbuster movies, it's hardly any wonder that this is where some actors are choosing to turn. After all, it's guaranteed work for a longer period of time than six months. Helena Bonham Carter is a force to be reckoned with. She's done some stinkers in her time, like Kenneth Branagh's Frankenstein, but we'll forgive her. The actress has starred in some fan favorites like Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street, and Fight Club. Her talent is limitless, and when it came to playing Bellatrix Lestrange, she was an interstellar choice. No one does dark and morbid quite like her. She was married to Tim Burton, remember? As far as earnings go, Carter has raked in $60 million for her efforts on the franchise, as well as her body of work outside of it. She may have been a villain, but audiences still loved to watch her on screen. In fact, Helena was so dedicated to her craft that she once accidentally burst the eardrum of a fellow actor by poking a wand too far in his ear. If that's not wizarding malice, then what is? Her estimated worth is a sum most of us can only dream about, while pouring out another shake at Mickey D's. <sighs> Clearly, Kenneth Branagh's divorce from Emma Thompson didn't dent his bank balance too much way back when. If it did, then it soon rebounded thanks to his constant presence in the biz. These days, Branagh sleeps in a bed of $100 bills. Well, he probably doesn't, but we would if we had $60 million. Heck, we would if we had a hundred bucks. Branagh has many talents, and acting is just one of them, as he displayed with his zealous portrayal of Gilderoy Lockhart. He's a successful director, producer, and writer so if he runs out of roles, he can simply create one for himself. That's not bad going. Old Ken has starred in Thor, Murder on the Orient Express, and Cinderella, to name a few of his acting credits. Given his extensive body of work, it's unlikely you'll ever see Brana searching for pennies down the side of a couch. He might be getting a little longer in the tooth, but Ken is still a red carpet staple and a happy addition to any project, even if two of his ex-lovers are involved. Out of the three main cast members, Emma Watson has arguably been the most successful. Sorry, fellas, but this girl is running the world. At least in Hollywood. The Hermione actress has gone on to win countless awards and starred in movies like The Perks of Being a Wallflower and Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Emma has landed numerous campaigns with designer labels and has also been advocating for good causes. All her work, Harry Potter included, has kept her $18 million ahead of the curve. The star still has her whole life ahead of her to top that sum up too. At this rate, she'll be one of the richest celebrities on earth by the time she's done. Through it all, Watson has managed to maintain a squeaky clean image and shied away from scandal. Maybe Hermione's goody two-shoes character left a lasting impression. You wouldn't find Hogwarts' finest stumbling in and out of bars at 3am and getting caught on camera, would ya? Although it has to be said that Emma did a great job of parodying herself in Seth Rogen's venture, the end.
Yes, he wasn't one of the main stars, we can't get around that, but Harry Potter did help launch the career of Robert Pattinson. Cedric Diggory may have only reared his head in the Goblet of Fire, but it was a solid enough acting credit to land Pattinson future gigs. Before long, he was starring next to cross-eyed Kristen Stewart in the Twilight Saga as heartthrob vampire Edward Cullen. Took him a little while to distance himself from the character he played for several years, but now he focuses on dark, mature parts. He played the Dauphin of France in Netflix's The King opposite Timothy Chalamet and took over from Ben Affleck as Batman. He's a grade-A superstar with an impressive fan base, which largely explains his $100 million safely tucked away in the kitty. Pattinson is still unassuming and quite shy, which only goes to boost his profile. He's pushed himself further into the Hollywood it crowd. Rob hasn't put a foot wrong yet. Finally, at our number one spot is Daniel Radcliffe, aka Harry Potter himself. Danny Boy earned an honest living in his youth as the titular character, but his endeavors didn't stop there. He has starred in some questionable movies since, like Horns, and has also branched out to Broadway, television, and even YouTube. He's done well for himself. His notoriety post-Potter may not be up to Emma Watson's par, but he's a darn sight richer with a net worth of $125 million. Sure, it's not all about money, but it certainly helps keep the worries at bay, doesn't it? Saying that, it's thought that $90 million of Radcliffe's fortune came directly from the J.K. Rowling movies. He's got the Wizarding World to thank for an awful lot, like his sprawling mansions and, you know, lifelong security. Prepare to be freaked out. Are you ready? Because it's been almost 20 years since the first Harry Potter film hit the big screen. We'll give you a few seconds to recover from that shock. While the franchise might be close to two decades old, it still has some secrets up its sleeve. With characters so beloved, there's no shame in losing the actor behind them. You might not realize it, but some of your favorite actors have been hiding in your favorite franchise for quite some time. So let's investigate further and see if we can't find out which famous stars you did didn't know we're in Harry Potter. This one is a blink and you miss it kind of deal. Oh my god! There's a brief scene where we see Hermione erase her mother's memories in order to protect her from the Death Eaters. The last time you watched it, you may have been crying so hard that you didn't catch that it was Michelle Fairley. Before Deathly Hallows, Fairley wasn't really known for much. She appeared in several small television roles and a few movies, but probably nothing you'd know. Then came her big break as Hermione's mom, for like three seconds of runtime. That being said, it is very impressive that they were able to make us cry in such a limited amount of time. Even Pixar can't do it that fast. <laughs> Where might you know her from? Well, a little television show called Game of Thrones. Lady Star. Fairly played the Stark family matriarch Caitlin Stark for several years on the acclaimed series. For quite a while, she was the heart and soul of the series. When, spoilers, Ned Stark left the show after season one, Caitlin was the only one trying to keep the family together. She showed quite a lot of intelligence, tenacity, and heart in her time as one of the show's leading actresses. Unfortunately, that was all for naught because she was also written out in a bloody fashion. It's not all bad, though. At least she managed to leave the show before it turned into a ridiculous dragonfire mess. Seriously, if a scorpion managed to take out Rhaegal with no problem, how could Drogon destroy them all? Sorry, sorry, still not over it. Since then, she's appeared in several things like 24 or Live Another Day, but nothing that reaches the heights of her earlier work. Surely the Witcher needs a loving but stern mother figure, right? Every time you think of Robert Pattinson, you probably think of Edward Cullen from Twilight. This is a fact that even Pattinson is annoyed by, despite the fact that the franchise made him famous. So it's forgivable if you've forgotten that Pattinson actually got his start in a different young adult franchise. He broke big with the part of Hufflepuff heartthrob Cedric Diggory. It's strange to think the two characters being played by the same actor. Edward was pretty dour, where Diggory was one of the most charismatic guys in Hogwarts. His his career took a bit of a hit because of Edward Cullen. Does anyone actually remember the movie Remember Me? It was truly terrible. For a while, it seemed like his best work was just going to be those cheesy perfume commercials. It's taken a lot of hard work, but Pattinson managed to resurrect his career and is back on the A-list. 
Get it? Resurrect? You know, because he played a vampire? Ugh, never mind. In 2019, he got quite a lot of attention for his role in The Lighthouse opposite Willem Dafoe. It was one of the most underrated films of the year, with people initially begging the Academy to nominate both stars. Too bad that didn't happen. Still, it affirms that Pattinson was absolutely more than just Edward Cullen. In 2020, he's following that up with the Christopher Nolan spy film Tenant. If it's anything like Inception, we're probably in for a wild ride. Judging from the careers of Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he's only going to get more famous from here. It's pretty hard to outdo a Nolan film, but getting cast as the new Batman is surely a good way to try. Pattinson will star in Matt Reeves' take on the character. So he went from a Batman to THE Batman? Okay, that's the last one, no more. Vern Troyer is probably not a name you would recognize, but you'd likely recognize the actor. You definitely would if you were a fan of the Austin Powers movie franchise. You might not recognize him for his role in the Harry Potter franchise, though. He was the first actor to play Grip Hook in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It was a small role, but certainly a memorable one. Even though the character returned, Troyer wasn't asked to. Still, we can always remember him for his role he's more famous for. He played Mini-Me, Dr. Evil's clone, in the last two Austin Powers movies. His performances there earned him quite a bit of fame. It's pretty hard to forget that rap scene with him and Mike Myers in Goldmember. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. They just don't make movies that love to be silly for silly's sake like that anymore. After that, most of his appearances were just as himself. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, he passed away in the year 2018, so we won't get to see him reprise either of his most famous roles. The name Dom Howe Gleason probably doesn't ring much of a bell for you. You definitely would know the famous ginger actor if you saw a picture of him. He got his big break as Bill Weasley in the Harry Potter film franchise. His part was seriously cut from what it was in the books, but he still made quite the impression on fans. From there, he starred in several critically acclaimed movies. The first was the criminally underrated sci-fi romantic comedy About Time. If you haven't seen it, go watch it now. It's really adorable. The second was the artificial intelligence thriller Ex Machina. It's considered to be one of the best science fiction movies ever made. Despite all that, the role you would probably recognize him from is his turn as the First Order's General Hux. He played the role of Kylo Ren's evil rival throughout all three films of the sequel trilogy. Though, let's be real, he never got to outdo that Starkiller base speech. He knew he was only getting one big monologue in this franchise, and boy did he take it for all it was worth. What's crazy is that he's actually the son of another famous Harry Potter star. His father is none other than Brendan Gleeson. If you don't know already, that's Mad-Eye Moody himself. We can only imagine the Gleeson family meets up once a year to watch all the movies and share filming secrets. Do you think Brendan Gleeson could really see through that fake eye? These movies did have crazy budgets, so it could have happened. The younger Gleeson came dangerously close to appearing in a third beloved sci-fi property. The rumor was that he was briefly considered for the role of the Doctor from Doctor Who. That was before the role was awarded to Jodie Whittaker. While Whittaker is amazing in the role, it's a little sad. The Doctor always wanted to be Ginger. So close. Speaking of the Doctor, let's talk all about David Tennant. It's possible there is no British actor that is quite as beloved as Tennant right now. Oh. Most of that comes from his epic turn as the 10th Doctor in Doctor Who. Look at these people. There have been many different kinds of Doctors over the years, but none were quite as super heroic as Tennant's was. If that wasn't enough, he also played one of the best villains in the MCU as the despicable Kilgrave in Jessica Jones. Sometimes an actor is just a little too good, especially if it's a creepy role. He also played the charismatic demon Crowley in the Amazon miniseries Good Omens. It's probably the role fans have freaked out about the most ever since he played the Doctor. With all of these big franchises under his belt, you may have missed his beloved and quiet role in Broadchurch. There he plays an angsty detective opposite the Crown's Sophie Turner and 13th Doctor Jodie Whittaker. If you've never seen it, give it a shot. Although, fair warning, it's very sad. With all of these amazing performances behind him, it's fine if you've forgotten his Harry Potter role. He played Barty Crouch Jr. in Goblet of Fire. 
That's right, he was the creepy tongue guy. Wild, right? Tennant has several more television roles coming up, but rumor has it that he has more big franchise work coming up as well. Some say that he may be the villain of the second Doctor Strange movie, or even a cameo in The Batman. While all of that is well and good, can't he at least pop back by Doctor Who and meets the 13th Doctor? Pretty please? There's one actor who appeared throughout the Harry Potter franchise who is a bit more famous than you probably know. Warwick Davis enchanted us as Professor Flitwick even though he didn't have very many scenes. What's really strange is that he had more lines in his second Harry Potter role than his first. He replaced Vern Troyer as Griphook for the final two movies in the franchise. He had more screen time with this performance than he did with Flitwick or Troyer did the first time around. Perhaps the reason why is that people finally figured out just how famous he was. You see, Davis got his start as everyone's favorite Ewok, Wicked, in Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Sorry, Weechi fans, he's just not as cool. Not only that, but if you look hard enough, you'll see cameo appearances by him in several other Star Wars movies. He even reappears as an Ewok in Rise of Skywalker. He followed up Return of the Jedi with a starring role in the fantasy epic Willow. Before Lord of the Rings came out, Willow was considered one of the better fantasy movies. It's a bit dated now. Word is he'll be reprising his role in a new Willow television series. Hopefully it's more like Dark Crystal Age of Resistance and less the last season of Game of Thrones. Yes, still not over it! While most of the characters he plays are heavily made up characters, there's one leading role you maybe haven't seen. He starred as a fictional version of himself in Ricky Gervais's criminally underrated Life's Too Short. It only got one season, but it's quite funny in that cringe humor that Gervais excels at so much. If you like the BBC version of The Office or Extras, be sure to check it out. He even makes fun of his roles in both Star Wars and Harry Potter. Voldemort showed up on the big screen during the Goblet of Fire and was instantly one of the best movie villains. He stands among other titans like Darth Vader, Thanos, and that one guy from Highlander. That being said, there's no shame if you can't recognize the actor who plays him. That's because, unlike Voldemort, actor Ralph Fiennes actually has a nose. Or he's never had a nose and every film he has one is fake! It's probably the first way. Fiennes has had one of the most consistently successful careers in Hollywood. He got famous in the 90s due to his performances in The Schindler's List and The English Patient. After that, he had a famously creepy turn as the serial killer villain in Red Dragon. He's also been in other famous movies like The Reader, Coriolanus, and The Grand Budapest Hotel. Now he seems to have replaced his need to be an evil wizard for a desire to be a spy. He was brought in as the new M to replace Judy Dench in Skyfall. Since then, he's played the character in every James Bond movie. He's also slated to play a super spy in the new spy prequel, The Kingsman. It's like Kingsman, but with like an extra space and an S. No matter how many movies he does, he'll likely never have one as instantly famous as Voldemort. Though he probably doesn't miss having to act with those stupid dots on his face. Look, sometimes Harry Potter just acts like a dummy. It's understandable. He didn't discover his wizarding gifts until the age of 11. Just be thankful he didn't turn into an obscurus. Instead, our favorite boy with a lightning star got into all sorts of adventures. The trouble is the only person with any sense in his friend group was Hermione. Even the binger can't deny she's witty as can be. But all the smarts in the world can't save us from Harry's stupid decisions. Just watch. Some of these entries will have you wishing for an Obliviate straight to the face. When Ron is the voice of reason, you know you messed up. He told Harry with all his sincerity not to mess with sentient magical objects. Instead, Harry fully engages with a diary created by the world's darkest wizard. Honestly, name a single good wizard that transferred some of their soul into a journal. Go ahead, we'll wait. Sure, some might argue that Harry's only in his second year. A 12-year-old's awareness of magic isn't going to properly understand the risk. Something you wish to tell me? No, sir. It's easy to justify the decision, but that doesn't make this one great. 
Think about all the good that would have come out of him turning it in. The petrifications would have ended earlier and Hermione might have been spared. On top of that, Dumbledore might discover the truth about the Horcruxes a bit earlier. The only downside is more of his classmates might start rumors about him being a dark wizard. It's the only reason he kept it a secret, and we all know it. We're not buying the curiosity argument. He didn't turn it in because he'd seem guilty. Way to go, Harry. Nope, nope, we can't do it. The moment's just too real, and the emotions are palpable. It's not your fault, Harry, but it kind of is? It feels wrong to say that, but when you lay it out there, it's sort of right. Technically, Bellatrix is responsible for all the grief we feel talking about that scene. She cast the curse, and she targeted her own family. It's a big reason why she's one of the biggest villains in the series. It's essential to acknowledge Harry's decisions that led to the moment, though. In the books, Harry makes the right decision to message Snape and attempt to flew Powder to the Order's headquarters first. Neither one works, and that's where the mistake happens. Harry gives in to his fear. It's an obvious flaw, given his age, but it doesn't change the cold, hard facts. Sirius went to the Ministry of Magic to save Harry after he fell for an obvious trap. He should be here. If Harry resisted the ploy by Voldemort, Sirius would still be there. Also, our emotional health would be better, but oh well. Time for us all to scream out into the unreceptive void. Harry should have opened the egg sooner. It's the kind of dumb teenager crap that makes us want to pull our hair out. It doesn't seem that maddening in the movies, but the books will frustrate you more. Cedric tells Harry the big hint about how to hear the clue weeks before the task. Mull things over in the hot water. Harry's Gryffindor shows a bit too much and his pride gets in the way. The whole school likes Cedric, except his friends, so Harry decides not to use the help. He gets in his own head. All his feelings about Cho and Cedric clouds his judgment and forces him to pull an all-nighter. Thank goodness for Dobby, or Neville, if you only watch the movies. That beautiful little elf is a saint. The annoying part is the procrastination. We can do that because, well, we're not wizards, competing in a deadly tournament. When the chips are on the table like that, you can't put off help. Face it, Harry got a bit too caught up in his pride and almost failed the task. You're 12 years old, you got school in the morning, but your alarm clock fails to go off. Some elf messed with it to save you from danger. As a consequence, you miss the bus, and you're gonna be late for school. What do you do? Do you A, wait for an adult to help fix the situation, or do you B, steal your parents' car and try to drive there yourself? If you chose B, then congrats, you're Harry Potter and Ron Weasley. The decision to toss all care aside and drive to the school makes no sense. The fact that the car is still there means Mrs. Weasley is still around. Why not wait for her to help fix this mess? Instead, our heroes risk exposing the entire wizarding world and damaged school property. Nice. People will argue that Hogwarts' location is secret, and the only way to get there is by the train, but that's not accurate. You're trying to tell us Molly Weasley didn't know how to call Dumbledore and ask for assistance? It's an exciting scene, but a foolish decision. Only people in a rush and people without sense buy makeup without trying it out first. The same rule is true for first-time spell use. Stop, stop, stop. Especially when the creator calls it Sectum Sempra. It just sounds vicious and evil. Harry couldn't have known what the spell was going to do, but in that case, he didn't need to use it. He was acting recklessly. Which, sure, Draco Malfoy is a bit of a prick, but he didn't deserve an untested spell to the chest. You can see the regret in Harry's eyes the minute he uses that magic. Look at his face. He looks like a dog that just got into the trash. He would be in so much trouble if he weren't the chosen one. His defenders claim the choice makes sense, given the heat of battle. Draco starts the fight, and Harry was in the right to finish it. Still, there were more options for him to use. He had a shot on Draco regardless. He didn't need to choose an untested spell. He decided his makeup without testing it. And both situations leave you looking like a clown. Harry Potter, grabbing random magical objects since 1997. 
He really never stops to consider the consequences, does he? After all, this is the same kid who stuck his hand into an apparent cursed item. It's no shock to watch him grab his prophecy from the shelf like it's no big deal. It's the Philosopher's Stone all over again. Keep in mind, we're here in the Ministry of Magic because of an earlier poor decision, which, yes, Harry is full of them in the Order of the Phoenix. Hermione Granger, the clear voice of reason that sometimes gets ignored, warns Harry not to take the magical ball off the shelf. Harry, a wizard prone to ignoring good advice, takes the magical ball off the shelf. Look, everyone, it had his name on it. What was he gonna do? Not grab the thing with his name on it? He's just too curious to resist that kind of thing. Of course, the minute he touches it, the Death Eaters show up. He falls for two traps in a row. <sighs> Honestly, Harry, how did you make it this far? For those unaware, Voldemort uses a taboo charm on his name. The charm associates an effect with a name or phrase. In this case, it's you-know-who's name. The only people brave enough to say it are members of the Resistance. The Dark Lord uses the charm as a tracker. Voldemort. It reveals their location to him and his army. Ron tells Harry not to say the name. The book makes that abundantly clear. And the movie planned on making that distinct as well. The trouble comes in Harry's pride and determination. He accidentally says the name Voldemort in the heat of the moment. It's at that exact point the Snatchers show up and take the three of them to Malfoy Manor. Honestly, you can't make up this level of daftness. We usually get a cautious and reserved Harry, but the moments he's not stand out more because of it. Dobby didn't need to go save them if they managed to avoid the taboo. Just keep that in the back of your mind next time you want to get mad at Harry. It's not easy for Harry to meet new people and make friends. He's shown to shell himself in often, and it takes effort to earn his trust. Hermione and Ron are the only two people Harry tells everything within his age group. That dynamic proves to be a wrong decision in one big moment. For a brief period, Harry and Cho become boyfriend and girlfriend. It's Harry's first real relationship, and given the circumstances, he handles it well enough. We'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the cringiest of cringe moments from their time together, though. Yes, we're talking about that date. Harry takes Cho to Madame Puddifoot's right around Valentine's Day. The place is crowded with happy couples having a great time. However, Harry and Cho aren't one of those couples. Cho wants to talk about Cedric, someone who is close with both her and Harry. However, the Chosen One only talks about that night with his trusted advisors. Cho is cut off, and Harry shows he can't open up fully. It couldn't hurt Harry. She was grieving too, and she needed a form of closure that you could have provided. Wizards and goblins were in a strained relationship during Harry's pursuit of the Horcruxes. The two have a history of mistrust, so any deal between the two groups would be on shaky ground. All that context is essential when considering Harry's interaction with Griphook, the Gringotts goblin they saved from the manor. The goblin wants a valuable prize for his efforts to help. After all, breaking into the vault of Bellatrix Lestrange is dangerous and comes with a high risk. To balance that out, Griphook requests the Sword of Gryffindor in exchange. Yes, the same sword the team needs to destroy the Horcruxes. Harry does his best to scam the goblin. He tells him he can have the sword once he's helped them. Harry and company think they're being smart by not giving the exact time they need to give up the sword. Instead, the goblin sees right through a blatant wizard lie. He crosses them before they can do the same. The end result is a mess of a heist, built off the back of a transparent and needless lie. Imagine for a moment that Harry was not the boy who lived. Would he have gotten special treatment during the second task in the Triwizard Tournament? We think not, and some of you may agree. Regardless, he got away with a mistake, but that doesn't mean we can't point it out. By now, we all know Harry isn't perfect. That same song Harry took forever to listen to affected his performance in the race. His use of Gillyweed allowed him to make it to the rescue point faster than anyone. Once he's there, he manages to save Ron with relative ease. There's a problem, though. He can only take one. He fears the worst and thinks the Mer people will eat Floor's sister if he doesn't act. Really, Harry? Did he actually think the Wizarding World would be okay with that happening? Even Ron and Hermione call him out on that after the fact. He almost lost everything by taking that too seriously. The schools would never risk harm on any wizard not chosen to compete. It's not even plausible. Voldemort was the most feared dark wizard to ever appear in the wizarding world of the Harry Potter books and movies. He accumulated a legion of ruthless followers on a quest for power that spanned generations. The man who was Tom Riddle was considered so dangerous that he came to be known as he who shall not be named. But was Voldemort really the most powerful wizard of all time? 
he would certainly like to believe he was, but power comes in many forms, and numerous strong witches and wizards populated the wizarding world. Voldemort was driven by a twisted need to dominate and control, yet the power of others was driven from other motivations like bravery, love, and the desire to protect. No matter where their power came from, there were quite a few individuals in the wizarding world whose strength surpassed even Voldemort. Here are 10 of those witches and wizards ranked from powerful to indestructible. Oh, and just to avoid making things too obvious, we're excluding Harry from this one. Lily Potter was, of course, the mother of the boy who lived, Harry Potter. Yet, that doesn't tell her whole story. Lily was born to muggles, but still proved to be an extremely talented witch. She excelled as a student at Hogwarts, especially in the subject of potions, and she was eventually chosen to be head girl. When Voldemort started recruiting and manipulating witches and wizards into joining his cause, Lily defied him at least three times. Instead of bowing to Voldemort, she and her husband James devoted themselves to the Order of the Phoenix and made every effort to thwart him. When the couple learned that Voldemort was after their soon-to-be-born son, Harry, they went into hiding. When Harry was a year old, the Potter's friend Peter Pettigrew, aka Wormtail, betrayed them and gave their location up to the Dark Lord. Voldemort swiftly attacked, but instead of taking Voldemort's offer to step aside, Lily gave her own life to save her son. She protected Harry to the horrible end, all the while begging for his life. It was the love symbolized by Lily's sacrifice that protected Harry from the curse Voldemort launched at him, a pure magic that Voldemort could never hope to replicate. Lily was the first to prove that the indestructible Dark Lord could be defeated. Kingsley Shacklebolt isn't given nearly as much attention in the Harry Potter series as many of the other characters mentioned here, yet that doesn't make him any less of an asset in the fight against Voldemort. Shacklebolt captured Dark Wizards as an aura for the Ministry of Magic, and by all accounts, excelled at the job. In denial over the return of Voldemort and others were colluding with the Dark Lord. Shacklebolt realized the danger and became a double agent for the Order of the Phoenix. He also repeatedly showed that he could more than hold his own when going up against Voldemort's followers. He prevailed against multiple Dark Wizards at once. He also held off Voldemort in a head-to-head -head duel, and later teamed up with Professor McGonagall and Slughorn to take him on a second time. Level-headed, brave, and impressively talented, it should come as no surprise that Shacklebolt eventually became the Minister of Magic. Throughout the majority of the Harry Potter series, Molly Weasley was simply the matriarch of the large, unruly Weasley clan. She was also the closest thing Harry had to a living mother. Outside using the spells and various household chores, Mrs. Weasley's magical abilities were never showcased extensively. She was a graduate of Hogwarts and a member of the Order of the Phoenix, but her most formidable power seemed to be chewing out her difficult sons for their various mishaps. It wasn't until she encountered Bellatrix Lestrange during the Battle of Hogwarts that the true extent of her power finally became apparent. When Bellatrix came after her daughter Ginny, Molly didn't hesitate to jump into the fray. Bellatrix was an extremely powerful Dark Witch who had taken down numerous members of the Order of the Phoenix. She definitely underestimated what she was dealing with when she went up against Mrs. Weasley. In the ensuing fight, Molly proved to be a fantastic duelist and highly capable of non-verbal magic. Eventually, she hit Bellatrix with a barrage of curses and won the battle. Mrs. Weasley demonstrated that when it comes to magical prowess, you should never judge a book by its cover. Like Lily, she also proved why you should never mess with a witch by threatening her child. Hermione Granger was considered the brightest witch of her age. She may have been born to a pair of muggle dentists, but she rose far above her humble beginnings. Not only was she clever and talented, she was also extremely book smart and determined to learn as much as possible about all things magical. She demonstrated an impressive set of abilities from an early age and her power continued to grow as she learned and practiced more. Hermione was there to assist Harry in his fight against Voldemort every step of the way. Every time Harry or Ron needed help, she was there to keep everyone going. Without her, Harry would likely have met his end several times over. She's the best with spells, making antidotes, and predicting the potential consequences of magic. Harry may be the chosen one, but Hermione is the one that always manages to hold things together. Throughout their years at Hogwarts, Hermione was instrumental in many battles. She also was one of the founders of Dumbledore's army. This was an organization formed when the students realized that they needed to be better prepared to fight against Voldemort. While she was an overachiever who was eager to please, she was also willing to break the rules when an injustice was done or a friend was in need. Ultimately, if Harry hadn't taken Voldemort down, it's quite possible that Hermione would have found a way to. 
Alistair Mad-Eye Moody was the best Auror ever. He was given credit for filling half of the cells in Azkaban prison personally. While he lost both a leg and an eye in the line of duty and eventually devolved into paranoia, his talent for taking down dark wizards was still intact. He was so skilled that he was able to drive off one of Voldemort's followers with just the tap of his staff. Despite his qualms, Moody became the leader of the Order of the Phoenix. He cast the protection charms that kept the Order's headquarters safe from Voldemort and his minions over the years. He was also a formidable duelist and highly skilled at non-verbal spells. After Dumbledore, Moody was the wizard Voldemort was most concerned about. Although Moody eventually fell to a curse hurled at him by Voldemort, it wouldn't have happened without the cowardly actions of Mundungus Fletcher. That one moment doesn't diminish Moody's prodigious powers. Bellatrix was strange was Voldemort's right-hand woman. She was completely committed to his cause and determined to see his objectives fulfilled. For Bellatrix, a lot of the attraction to Voldemort's cause seemed to be the ability to cause fear and mayhem wherever she went. Violent and driven mad by her time in Azkaban, Bellatrix was nonetheless an unbelievably accomplished witch and a terrifying opponent. She carried out Voldemort's orders with unabashed and often lethal enthusiasm. She also followed her own desire to get revenge on the members of her family she saw as traitors. She gleefully ended her cousin Sirius Black and her niece Nymphadora Tonks in different battles. She also defeated multiple Aurors and took on a trio of powerful witches during the Battle of Hogwarts. It was only when she encountered Molly Weasley that she met her match. Though Voldemort may have been the visionary behind his movement, without Bellatrix, he wouldn't have gotten far. Perhaps that's why Voldemort shouted in dismay when Bellatrix fell. Gellert Grindelwald is considered one of the most dangerous dark wizards of all time, second only to Voldemort. Yet, while Voldemort was highly skilled in certain types of magic, he wasn't all-powerful. Meanwhile, in his youth, Grindelwald rivaled Dumbledore in sheer magical talent. As an adult, Grindelwald escaped from prison and managed to stay under the radar for 20 years while also taking over a great deal of Europe. Later, he stood up to an interrogation under Voldemort. He never gave up the location of the Elder Wand, the most powerful wand known to the wizarding world. Yet, Grindelwald's biggest claim to fame is the duel he almost won against his former friend Albus Dumbledore. Known as the greatest duel of all time, Dumbledore and Grindelwald fought for nearly three hours, with each holding their own for much of that time. Grindelwald almost won, but Dumbledore thankfully emerged victoriously and sent Grindelwald to prison for the rest of his life. If not for Dumbledore's heroic intervention, Grindelwald would probably have successfully taken over the wizarding world. Minerva McGonagall was an important member of Hogwarts faculty. She taught Transfiguration and was head of Gryffindor House. Stern but fair and a fierce defender of her students, Professor McGonagall's depth of magical knowledge made her an incredibly strong witch. She was an animagus, giving her a rare skill that enabled her to turn herself into a cat, an ability she used to do in the dangerous work of spying on Voldemort's followers for information useful to the Order of the Phoenix. With her calm poise and strict demeanor, Professor McGonagall could be intimidating, but she was also impossible to not respect. Although she never chased a fight, when one came to her, she never shied away, and she proved to be a talented duelist on more than one occasion. She took on one of Voldemort's followers and won, and even fought Severus Snape to a draw. She challenged Voldemort alongside her allies Kingsley Shacklebolt and Professor Slughorn. It's no wonder that after Voldemort was finally defeated, she succeeded Dumbledore to become the headmistress of Hogwarts. Severus Snape is hard to root for throughout most of the Harry Potter saga. The surly potions master and head of the House of Slytherin wasn't exactly an endearing presence. Plus, he clearly held a grudge against Harry for no apparent reason. He made the young boy's life more difficult than it had to be for years. Once we learned Snape's full story, though, it was hard not to feel some sympathy for the so-called Half-Blood Prince. He, too, had an incredibly challenging life, a life that would have broken lesser wizards. Snape's magical talents were evident from an early age. When he came to Hogwarts as a student, he already knew more curses than many more advanced students. He invented his own spells, made his own potions, and was an impressive duelist. But perhaps Snape's greatest gift and curse was his ability to hide his true intentions from everyone around him. He acted as a double agent for Dumbledore for years, bringing back intelligence for the Order of the Phoenix. While Voldemort was an extremely talented mind reader, Snape eluded even his detection as he carried out his lonely mission. The character of Snape is not black or white and couldn't be exactly called heroic, but the sacrifices Snape made in service to Dumbledore are noble. Without his considerable power, which enabled him to deploy magic in all forms, Voldemort would likely not have been defeated. 
Number one on our list is Albus Dumbledore, a choice that won't be much of a surprise to anyone with even a passing familiarity with the wizarding world. Dumbledore was the headmaster of Hogwarts and was widely considered to be one of the most powerful wizards of all time. He was also the only wizard Voldemort truly feared. Dumbledore's accomplishments were legendary. He discovered 12 uses for Dragon's Blood, he won every award offered by Hogwarts, and was published in multiple respected wizarding journals. He also demonstrated skills with magic of all kinds, created his own spells, invented magical devices, and was a master duelist. He defeated Gellert Grindelwald in an epic duel even though Grindelwald possessed the supposedly undefeatable Elder Wand. He also took on many of Voldemort's followers and Voldemort himself to protect Harry. Yet the strengths that made Dumbledore truly powerful was his kind wisdom. At one point, Dumbledore almost went down the wrong path. Attracted to power, he realized after a family tragedy, it would be his downfall. So he chose not to continue to amass power. Instead, he decided to stay at Hogwarts and help others, a choice that showed his true character. Dumbledore was inspirational to his students, setting an example of what a good wizard could and should be. The students even named their army in his honor, an action that showed just how devoted they were to their headmaster and how indestructible Dumbledore's legacy was. That's our magical roundup of the wizards and witches that could easily best the Dark Lord. Are there other members of the wizarding world that you would include in this list? Let us know in the comments down below who would be in your ranking of characters stronger than he who shall not be named. I said his name like 60 times in this video. Am I going to be okay? And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.